Welcome back to Creative Culture, a podcast that's all about, well, creativity and culture, or more specifically, how the two intersect. But even more importantly, it's about creative people and the many, many ways they express their creativity through such diverse interests as art, building, filmmaking, writing, tarot reading, poetry, fashion design, graffiti, cooking, architecture, interior design, the list goes on and on. This show is a positive, curious space for you to spend an hour twice a month, a podcast to enjoy a conversation that you can learn from, reflect upon, and maybe be inspired to pursue your own creative interests. You know that artistic thing you've just been telling yourself you want to try? Well, don't wait. Do it now. CJ the X is an artist, writer, philosopher, musician, and all-around deep thinker whose work largely explores our culture's relationship with art, often as presented through the lens of social media. CJ is a content producer. I'm not sure if that's a term that they're comfortable with. Producing well-thought-out, well-researched, and highly entertaining videos on topics such as the seven deadly art sins, subjectivity in art, objectively bad art, as well as tackling topics such as the Folgers Coffee Christmas Incest <laughs> commercial, <laughs> one, of, one of my one of my favorites, uh, stra- <laughs> Stranger Things and the Meaning of Life, and and why you need to skip the first five minutes of Tangled. I totally agree on that. Their videos are not for short attention spans. Be prepared to sit and focus, focus for thirty minutes or an hour or even longer. CJ is also a musician whose music can be heard on Spotify, YouTube, or whatever corporate brand you most identify with. (laughs) (laughs) They also write critical essays on culture and philosophy, especially as it pertains to the online social landscape, all of which can be read at their website at cjvx.com. Hold on to your pearls. This is going to be a ride. CJ, thanks for joining me. It's great to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. That was such a good intro. I feel so, uh, I'm beaming now. Thank you. How's your your new video uh, coming along? You've been working on a video for a very long time. I got to see the, I was honored to see the kind of first part of this video in person with you up in Toronto. And it was quite an experience. I I think I saw like the first hour and a half of this. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, It's been good. I mean, working on the video, I'm in a good space with it right now. Which is uh, to say, you know, that's still the pain of it not being done. But it's like, I know that this is the right feeling, though. Like the progress one where you're thinking and even when it's hard, right. something's getting done and every day it moves farther. And it feels like it feels meaningful, if not pleasant. Does that make sense? Oh, sure. And how, how long, how much longer do you have to go on this? Do you think before it's um, all going to be completely released? I gave myself like kind of the end of the month as like a deadline. So this is kind of the, I'm, oh. I'm in like a, you know. A crunch you know what I mean but like in a, in a good way right yeah. it was a necessary like even that thing you know with Greg set up that viewing and that was yeah. like you know I'm generally like not a fan of like artificial deadlines like I don't tend to work like better with them like making those little things or in the past maybe I haven't worked great with them like I just need to kind of find my inspiration and follow it and then like allow especially on YouTube allow me to like manifest whatever the thing is that I need to be manifesting but um when Greg set that like viewing that you were at as a deadline that actually did move me in a way I needed. And so I kind of am leading into the deadline thinking to just to get the motion. You know what I mean? I just not right. normal for me, but I'm doing it now. But does that work when you set your own deadlines? I mean, having somebody else <laughs> set a deadline for you, <laughs> it's a little different. I generally advise like YouTubers to not announce their projects because like you're, you know, you say like, oh, I'm going to have it out by the end of the week. And then you're a YouTuber that wakes up at noon and has like no work ethic. That's why you're a YouTuber. So then like you end up in a position where you're like on Twitter going like, oh, I'm sorry, guys, maybe next after the weekend. And then you're like in a position where it's like, why didn't you just not announce it and just put it out? Like, did you gain yeah. anything from this? Um, no, so but this, also, is, this has totally been also, my philosophy. Mm. This has totally been my philosophy for like the past few years is that because I I was on one of these schedules where I was posting one video a week. I did that for like three years or so. And then Jeez. during during the lockdown, I was posting a video a day, which was insane. And then now, <laughs> like a couple of years ago, I'm like, you know what? I'm just done with all this shit. I'm going to post a video when it's done and whenever yeah. that happens to be. And I'm not going to drive myself crazy with this. 
Yeah, I, I think it's just like, to me, it's just that like, you got to watch your balance creatively, where if you realize you're talking about the act of creation more than you're actually doing the creating. And I think it's for anything. It's like, if you're talking mm -hmm. about doing something more than you're doing it, I'm like, man, life is about doing. It's not about thinking about doing. You got to just do, you know, do imperfectly, just start making more of it doing rather than thinking and talking about it. Because <laughs> it's also like a kind of... um. Uh, procrastination kind of amateurish hobbyist technique too as people go like oh I want to write a book one day and they talk about the book and the plot of the book and I'm going to write it one day and they haven't written anything it's like if once you write it you have you are a writer it's done right so the doing is always the meatier part you know is this something that you think all artists struggle with or you think artists kind of like this is what defines a successful artist is somebody who's just actually able to get shit done I think it makes it's the difference between an, like an artist and a not artist. I mean, I have this like I often say, like the only difference between, um, you know, someone who does something and someone who doesn't do something is whether or not you do the thing. So like with art, it's like I think you're an artist if you make art, you know, um, I mean, like lots of people like to like, you know, lots of people like to think about doing things. You know, I think about making movies and stuff like that. I think about writing scripts and trying to put something together and making a film and stuff. But like. I don't, I don't make films though. So I'm not a filmmaker, you know, maybe right. one day I will become a filmmaker, but you know, uh, and similarly, it's like, yeah, I don't know. You just got to do it, it. It's, it's so beautiful and so simple. It's like, if you want to become the person who does a thing, then you just have to do it. And that's it. That's the end of it. You already won. You know? it, it always feels like everybody has their novel in them. You know, they're always saying one of these days I'm going to write that novel, but you know, how, yeah, many, yeah. how many people actually write that novel? And yeah. then, of course, you get the people who always think that their life story is going to be the most interesting. Yeah, yeah. I got to write there. a book about my life. It's so interesting, my experiences. <laughs> yeah. No, so, which is fine, by the way. It's fine yeah. for people to feel that and think that and dwell on that fantasy. But, you know, it's only fantasy until it's actualized. So, yeah. Right, right. What, what, what's a good first step to get you off the couch and just stop talking about doing art and actually doing it? Well, I think, you know, I haven't listened to much of your podcast, but I did check out the episode with Dan Harmon just because I'm a, you know, mm. Harmon fan. And, sure. um, you know, that was one of the things that, uh, you know, was touching about hearing about, like, how, like, woodworking can become, like, your, like, a creative output and the difference between that and then something kind of more, like, sparkly and dense, like, like you know, making a movie or a TV show or, you know, an album for me or, like, this big philosophy project or whatever is, like, what it sounds like um, can be really beneficial about the woodworking thing is like um, you don't have to do it like perfectly and no one can even tell you that you've done it imperfectly if it's functional. Like if you make a, sh a bookshelf and if it holds your books, then that's it. And I think that's the thing that is most important for people for getting started in creativity is like to defeat this kind of disease of perfectionism mm -hmm. and this like idealistic fantasy of what it means to be an artist. I'm like, no, like, you know, when people are struggling to put, you know, pen to paper, I'm like, you know, you, you have, a, what's, let's put it, you know, if the only sentence in your mind is like, I fucking hate this and I can't like think of anything to write, then write that sentence you just said. And then now you've written something and it's over, you know, it's something over nothing quality above all. So, but there is, that's something over nothing is the first bit. It's like, if you have nothing, then get something down. It can be garbage. That's the thing is allow it to be terrible and then don't care. And then you're going to realize as soon as you've done a lot of garbage, you now have material to like edit and craft and pick the best of, you know? This is a big theme, and I have a newsletter I send out once a month, and a lot of it kind of explores these issues. And I, <clears throat> I kind of use woodworking as mostly a jumping off point to talk about larger issues. And perfectionism is, is, is definitely one of these issues that a lot of people who have entered into my realm doing woodworking have come from Silicon Valley, and they're coders, and they sit behind a desk, and they wanted something to do with their hands. Interesting. Yeah. But they come at woodworking and like a lot of different kinds of crafts with this whole mindset of numbers and analytics and perfection yeah. that when they're working with an organic material like wood, they get hung up on precise measurements and making sure everything fits together perfectly. And you have to get rid of that mindset or you will never get anything done. And, it, and as soon as you can kind of release that and understand that whatever you make is better because of those imperfections. And this is why I'm not like a huge fan of these computerized CNC machines that can cut wood and everything, because everything is perfect. There's no longer really the mark of the maker on that thing you made. So, I mean, it's sort of cliche to embrace your mistakes and to say that, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. 
Well, I think that, like, the embracing the mistakes thing, like, yeah, that's all true, and we should all, like, hug each other and kiss our flowers <laughs> right. and stuff, but but also, <laughs> I think the um, bigger thing is that, like, and, and that's something we were talking about when we, you know, after I screened some of my um, video essay and when we were chatting, and, you know, I got in one, like, big philosophical conversation with a couple people, um, and then I was talking to you, but, like, and and you were you know very sweetly being like wow I feel like out of my league and I'm like you're completely I still wrong do. <laughs> no but you're wrong like because because you know that was the best conversation I had of the night was with you because like you understand uh, something that um, it's not it's it's not a uh, easily captured in words I gotta say it's interesting you set up like the dichotomy between like Silicon Valley coding and like woodworking because mm-hmm. like that's exactly um the that, that there's that's there's both so loaded because the thing with like the woodworking thing um is like you're creating something with your hands and you're doing something physical and you're doing like the most human thing there is possible to do which is like culture has been passed down to you through like you know generations and generations and the culture has given you this information of like woodworking and creating things and you have these opposable thumbs and you have these hands and you can take things apart and put them back together again with like you know and, and participate in culture and like the idea of a bookshelf right and so tons of this information is not like codable like that's not in an encyclopedia that's the language that's that's the doing that's our forever memory like it's the most human thing in the world to like create something and to participate in culture and it's not easily capturable in an executable program and this is the thing about the silicon valley coding thing is there's something about um that world you know i had a colleague and also like a few people in my um community that have worked in like coding express this to me is there's something about the coding thing that that allows you to participate in this kind of um, Promethean delusion, like this, like you kind of think of yourself like God and you think of this stuff as like the truth instead of these things as being like these tools that humans are using because there's something about when it's disembodied, when it moves away from your hands and from physical space that makes it easy to kind of hype yourself up and believe that this stuff is the truth. And this is like, I don't know, like it's this truth that's like above, you know, I, I, I like, I like it to the, like, um, almost like a platonic split between like the spirit and flesh. Like you have your like sinful flesh, material, subjective, flimsy desires as you know, you know what I mean? This is what you, you know, your stupid human memory. That's like, you know, eyewitness testimony. So unreliable versus the truth, which is like what was caught on camera, you know, but the camera takes some of the soul away. Like it's, there's a truth, that thing where it's like, when you take a picture of someone, you take some of their soul because like the truth is reality is this malleable physical thing. And the reason I'm saying is like, there's a lot of information, information that's um in the physical space that can't that gets taken away when you snapshot it or you know there's there's uh, information involved in the practice of creating a table you know that gets taken away when you code it into a machine like the machine can't contain all of the human soul and we can't even articulate all of that information like it's it's literally like too much information to articulate like that's how much is in embodied space sorry you got me kind of riled up for a second well no i I think part of the argument i've heard from people on this is that these coders feel like what they're doing is a highly creative act and that's why i'm not the one to judge if putting numbers into code is creative or Uh, not but i'm i'm just kind of looking at it from i'm trying to look at it from their point of view and say yeah i i get that sort of but it still doesn't compare to taking a scrap of raw materials taking something and create, shaking basically just raw materials and creating something. So you're mm-hmm. making something out of almost nothing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, also, part of the coding world is that, like, so much of it is, and this is the part, like, I'm not trying to be such a, like, tech doomer. Like, I, what I think is important is to reinsert the soul and knowledge of the soul into the tech, right? Um, it, it, like, I would just say working with, like, this kind of machinery and high-tech stuff risks like this is the biggest piece of information it leaves out, but like meaning, you know what I mean? And like the nourishment of the soul, um, that's one of the biggest like truths that it can kind of leave out. And so and to, to, like, to draw attention to that in the coding world too, is like part of it is that like you are standing on the shoulders of giants, like tons of the tools you're using in code are things that other people have made, humans made, you know, with purpose. And I think reinserting like the humanity into it is like the essential component, but like, there's no matter how much, you know, um, for, for every person alive, I feel like no matter how, like, um, I don't know, enmeshed in your art, your cerebral art or your concepts or whatever, like nothing can 
uh, like replace the embodied experience part, which is something that I struggle with because I'm a pretty cerebral person and all my work is on my laptop and I love like my books and I love to type things. I don't like writing by hand and I have like, um, you know, I don't like working out or I don't play sports or <laughs> woodwork or anything. Um, and yet, especially, you know, like, you know, with the philosoph philosophical research and trying to get to, you know, meaning and try to give people meaning, I'm confronted with the obvious reality that like the body is so essential and the physical space is so essential. And I'm trying to get, so I got my, my, no my notebooks now and I try to do the journaling and I try to do the yoga and I try to remember that even though it doesn't come naturally to me, you know. How's that coming along with the journaling? I know it seems like so many people I know are, are really into journaling and they, they, they always tell me it has to be done by hand. Oh, I don't know if it has to be, but right. like pencil on paper. There's something different. I just wrote, um, I just published an essay like on my website that was, um, you know, a critique of social media and I called it a, a manifesto to return to web 1.5. It's a really, really good essay. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so this is me again, trying to reinsert like the soul into the tech world in the social media world, you know, to that, that was, that was an attempt to do that. But part of it is also, um, like trying to emphasize the importance of these kind of physical things. And one of the things that I, I touched on very briefly in kind of the outro of it was like the, um, yeah, the soulfulness of artifacts. I think that's, it. it's like artifacts, um, objects like physical objects that you can own and lovingly preserve that contain your memory and not allowing all of your memories to be you know cognitively offloaded into social media or a cloud or like this kind of non-real space inside of your black screen and your memory cards so um yeah so i have um i have a couple journals like right beside me because i was doing it right before we got on but like i have one that's like a little more like narrative or whatever or it's like uh, but but like I, the thing is I, that doesn't come well to me for some reason like the sitting down and writing down this is what i did today and this is what i'm thinking about it just feels like i think it's maybe partially because like i am a writer so i'm not good at like writing without like uh thinking and without turning it into like art <laughs> you know what i mean or thinking about somebody reading it yeah, exactly. Like writing it as if I am creating an art object, which means mm -hmm. I've already invited someone other theoretical person in the room to look at this thing critically. I'm just not good at that. But um, my therapist uh, gave me like, you know, he was showing me all of his stuff, um, you know, uh, of, of like that he does every single day, like his daily routine stuff, trying to help me get better at this. And uh, anyway, so so my other version, though, is like the other journal I have is literally just like, you know, at this point, it's like it's like you write three things in a gratitude list, three affirmations, like I am statements. And then I did like three like intentions, like what I'm going to be like today sure. or something, you know, and then maybe just like a, a couple lines of like journal, like what's happening today. Um, and like, you know, when you do that <laughs> for a while, I'm saying this not as an expert, but like this is the reason I'm trying to do it, you know, is like you can look back on your months and like you see like you and you have like a map of like yourself, you know, and you can see and for, for you know, my therapist, part of it was that like at the end of the day, he does a separate thing, which is like three things that went well, three things that can go better or whatever. And then over the next you know, a few days, it's like if you are saying, oh, I could have done this better three days in a row, or you haven't done this one habit you're trying to build three days in a row, you're like, what am I doing? And then you do mm -hmm. it, you know? And it's really essential to create some of these artifacts that you can look at to have like a map of you. And I think the doing it by hand and having it on paper part is more, again, like it's spiritual rather than functional. Because then like, I mean, this is for, like, this is infinitely more valuable, I think, to, you know, my children. <laughs> You know, to have mm -hmm. like this artifact of what their parent was like, rather than just to have like my blurry selfies on Facebook and like, you know, the art that I put out that's for everybody. It's like, what's right. for me and what's for my descendants? You know, what's for yeah, my Yeah, so this is, this is something that I've been kind of thinking a lot about this year. This is kind of part of my intentions at the beginning of the year is how do I want to produce art and how do I want to separate that from craft? And yeah, yeah. and is exactly is what... How does what you are making, the art that you're making, how is that informed by the audience that you're wanting to see that art? In other words, is it possible to make art just for yourself, such as basically what you're doing in the journaling, when you know that you're not creating it for other people? How does that affect how you're approaching the art? Because I know as I'm trying to kind of find my own art that I'm making right now, I feel like, and you've talked about this before, you have to have an audience or it really 
or somebody has to see it or it's not really art. Yeah, it hasn't so, completed its circuit yeah, or something. It's yeah. just <laughs> like this thing that you're doing. Although I find myself approaching it totally different because I'm not thinking of it as like, how are people going to look at this? And like to a bigger, oh, we'll have to get into the social media aspect of it. <laughs> but I think <laughs> for now, I guess that the bigger question is, how is your art d different if you know that nobody's going to see it? Is it better? Right. Is it possible? I mean, that's the thing. I, I right. don't know if it, um, I don't, I'm, I sometimes don't know if it is possible to like make art just for yourself. I think people mm -hmm. enjoy that narrative. I don't want to come out insulting people, but I do think it is a little bit of a cope sometimes when people yeah. cling to their like, oh, I make art just for me. I think that sometimes there's a kind of dishonesty because, um, you know, you secretly want, like the, the, the secret want when you make art just for me is that you know, people will think you're so freaking special and brilliant. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> like, I think that right. everyone to some degree, I mean, even if you're not making art, like, for the masses, even if you don't want, like, success or monetary success or to build a business or an audience or anything, even so, you still want some people to connect to your art and see you. If it's your friends or like-minded people or, you know, it's... I, and this is, I think C.T. Nguyen does a really good um, analysis of this. He has... um. I forget what the essay is called. It's called Aesthetic Sincerity and Trust, something like that. But his ideas was like, he calls it aesthetic sincerity, which is part of the game kind of of art, which is that you want, like you would be disappointed if you found out that I was making, you know, like uh, if I was writing up all this like tech critique stuff, not because I really cared about it, but because I was trying to impress a few people. You know what I mean? Like. Right no one likes to realize that the artist was like lying about what they like or like, you know, we would really resent it. We resent the idea that like Coldplay is selling out and doing pop music for money and popularity instead of doing the thing they really like doing, which is doing another, like a rush of blood to the head or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so like aesthetic sincerity is really important to people. And I think that, um, I, and I think that it's like, part of the game being played right or something like that. I, I, the way that Nguyen, I think, articulates it is like when people create out of aesthetic sincerity, then that enables them to get like the value out of art, which is when you deeply connect to people on this like personal level and um, you can vibrate around the same like uh, unspeakable little spot in reality where it's like, oh, we all feel like this in this way that we can't articulate without creating art. So sincerity, I think, is part of the game. But I think that also... Um, it's highly collaborative and we should be really honest about that. And I mean, collaborative between an audience, like everyone also wants, like, you don't want to be aesthetically sincere to the point that you can no longer communicate with the people that you want to communicate with. You know what I mean? Like, right. and part of the game of art is that communication is like, okay, so I created this thing. And so like, let's say I made like a song. The song is like a sentence that I wanted to say this thing that I couldn't say otherwise. And then if like, I'm showing it to people and they're not hearing the thing that I'm saying. I'm like, well, I should probably work on my language. You know what I mean? I should work on my ability to communicate that feeling. You know, I guess there's a little bit of content form dichotomy in there, but, um, which I generally don't agree with, but anyway, sorry, that was kind of a sprawling answer. I don't no, know. No, so was... it really wouldn't, it, it really isn't possible to create art alone. That's not informed in some sense by whoever's going to be seeing it or experiencing that art. Otherwise, you're, start, you're that's just... That's the start, for sure. Yeah, the right. start is like that kind of individualistic aesthetic sincerity. I'm just making this for me. Because mm -hmm. that's the precondition to play the game. Like, that's how you start, you know? But then well, I we're think... kind of told, like, you've got to have this release. I've got this artistic release. I just have to put it out there. Once I get this, you know, paint on canvas, I'll, I'll be free from it. And then that's it. That's what we're told that there, there's your experience. Right, you have right, experienced right. the art, but that's only half the equation. Well, that co that's what, that's what John Dewey would call a uh, discharge instead of expression where it's like, you have this sense, okay. this feeling bold building up in your chest. Right. And then anyone, like if I'm angry, I can just scream like whatever. Right. right. But if I'm angry and then expressing like, you know, like how you express like a grape, like you literally like push through it and get something new out of it that requires mediation. Like I do think that's intrinsic to the art process is not just discharging a feeling, but actually like doing something with it that pushes something kind of new out of it and has this, um, I'm trying to think of how to explain like this weird shape I'm doing with my hands, like like the, like the alien at the end of Arrival or something, like the oh, right. constant morphing. Yeah, you're right, right. So I guess on a okay. Well, now we got to get into this social media business because this is something that's uh, bothering me a lot. It is as I'm kind of 
trying to work on these newer art projects that are separate from woodworking or separate from everything else. And, and so my thought was, this was at the beginning of the year, and I've kind of experienced this thing, well, this, this stuff has to be seen because I was under this, I got to get this release, I got to do the, this yeah, yeah, art yeah. myself. But now I'm, I'm thinking, well, no, it doesn't really mean anything if I'm just doing it. And I have this desire to show it to people. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but at the same time, I'm finding what I'm doing, because for, I've been making YouTube videos for 15 years now. And so I, I, everything I do, all of the craft, all of the projects I make is informed by the viewers. And so as I'm making, whatever it is I'm making, as I'm making it, I'm thinking about the narrative. How is this going to play out? How do I show what I want to show? And so now when I'm trying to do this stuff without filming any of that, yeah. that mindset is still in me. And I'm trying to kind of break free from that and then think, I don't have to show everything. I just want to show the finished product. Right, right. But this is the problem with social media is that I think that it's informing art in a different way. So now, Absolutely. and I, I, I really think this, this started with short form video because, and when Instagram in particular switched from artists were able to show off their artwork. Mm, Boom. Yeah, Here's a yeah. beautiful a presentation. Square, yeah. square photos <laughs> of my artwork. Yep. But then in other, in order for people to view your artwork, you had to start shooting video. So then what happened is the art becomes the process, the video yeah, of you yeah, making yeah, yeah. the art oh, rather man, than yeah. the actual art itself. For sure. Um, so this is kind of, I think, is, is very detrimental to the art world when the platform itself is telling you how you need to present. Of course, yeah. Well, that goes back again to, like, is it possible to make art just for yourself? I mean, like, you start there, people are often, like, possessed by ideas, the muse strikes, or you're doing what you like, and that's definitely how you have to start. But to, again, like how John Dewey would call, like, even experience itself is like a doing and undergoing. It's like, but as you start to, like, you start there with yourself, but then you're not just a person in a, you know, in a bubble or in a vacuum in outer space in the middle of, you know, blackness with no stars or planets to guide you. You're in a community of people. So as you continue on that kind of process of pursuing your artistic sensibilities, other people are going to see it. And then, you know, you're also going to, like, your standards for yourself are going to raise and you're going to want to edit and tinker and you're going to continually have new ideas and you're going to realize, other people have also done similar things to what you're doing. So you're, there is even your, your consciousness of like other culture is like the undergoing. That's the audience if you're not even sharing it yet. At least the audience is like if you're writing a piano piece, your audience is like Bach or whatever, whatever you're into, right? You're interacting with the culture that is like, you know, you basically. But yeah, and then the way that you decide to perform it, I guess, or the medium that is going to transmit your art to other people um, if that absolutely changes your art and changes how you're doing it. And, you know, social media is so, um, it's so damaging to uh, the dignity of performance, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's, it's funny you say like Instagram being kind of positive for art because I completely agree. And it's so fascinating, like when you start to uh, pull these, like what is the problem of social media apart and thinking about social media as like this aesthetic um harnessing in this like this this aesthetic change this aesthetic undergoing that happens to our art you know what i mean um it start to realize that there's actually a kind of there's a hierarchy of like different social media platforms forms are worse actually you know and so instagram i've said for a while actually is strangely not bad like in concept because it actually retains some dignity of performance in that there's a post and there's a post under which there are comments and isn't that crazy that that seems like a high standard because the alternative <laughs> is like tiktok twitter or now the stories and the reels where it's just this sludge there isn't a difference between a comment and the performance there isn't individuality there's not a person with a profile that makes a post it's all just this big um I wish I could. It's it's a, it's 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 a snake pit. It's like crabs. Well, in a you're bucket. not even, and you're not choosing to watch uh, these things either. Whereas on a post or anything else, even on YouTube, you're clicking on a. You at video, least you're clicking on a post and engaging with it, and then you could see. comment on the post. Like you're orbiting around an object. You know, I think right. the most addictive, mind blasting thing 
um, of like TikTok, like the, the, that the most addictive thing is this mind blasting where you erase all the barriers between individuals and it just becomes this slur, you know, slurry. Um, anyway, sorry, I was kind of dancing into a tangent, it's, but like the like the but the deeper problem with social media, I think more broadly, I do think for artists is that um, they're constantly pressured to post their progress. And I think that is really mm -hmm. problematic because a lot I think that if the art objects that we create are almost always to be shared, you know, I think the process should be for you. Like a lot of the process should be done alone because that boredom, that self-doubt, that frustration, the pursuing of your aesthetic sincerity, you know what I mean? Um, that's, that's like the human experience. Like, I don't know. There's something really essential about that that gets robbed when you make the process because the, the pro product. process has become the thing. We, yeah. Nobody other than if you you know want to deep dive into Michelangelo or something and understand his process and this kind of thing, that wasn't the main idea. And so I'm kind of thinking now it seems like almost all art now has to be seen first through that lens of production, whether you're making music, I mean, unless you're, you know, top tier superstar, yeah. you can well, if you can afford like to be esoteric or whatever, and then even yeah. them, and then even like no one is fucking immune to the desire to post progress because it's like right at your fingertips, you know. Um, but yeah, it's it it's not it's not it's not good, and also it requires you. I think that it's important for people to feel like the product or the art that they're presenting, the performance they're giving is a performance and not their life. Cause I think that's the parasociality is like, I think it, it, it tilts us all towards parasociality when we're always posting our progress and we're just kind of simulating this closeness and we're not allowing ourselves to like have our lives and then our experience of creating something and then like the dignity of performing the thing that we created rather than performing our lived experience like our waking minutes and hours you know i don't think you should be living in a constant state of performance that, that's really bad and then i think that also <laughs> um i don't know if it helps other people a lot of the time like that to perform the process i feel like that might become something where like people uh, consume your process instead of engage in the process of their own accord, you know? Yeah. Or I think it just becomes so much more, frankly, it's more interesting than the art in a lot of cases. And I, I follow somebody on Instagram. What is who, the process thing? The process work posting? The, pr the process of making the art kind of becomes top tier that that yeah. is the, the most important thing and this is i think a lot of people have embraced this i follow this woman on instagram who it does these they're they're really cool paintings but it's the whole thing is how she makes them so it's like she shoots yeah. darts of paint and she throws things and she grabs objects and put and it's really interesting to see how this made when it's all said and done yeah the artwork is beautiful but the how she did it has become way more important so she is just right. totally leaning into the what the platform wants well that's and that's interesting because like again when i complain about all these different like social media uh landscapes like you know it's not that it's impossible to do beautiful things with them it's not like they have no value of course the indomitable human spirit will figure out a creative beautiful way to use fucking anything uh, is it okay that i swear sorry i didn't check yeah <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, so, so of course, right. So that sounds like, um, you know, the performance of process is actually like really ideal for this particular person. Like the, and, and that is its own thing. It's like the process becomes part of the art object. Um, but like, I don't know, for me, a lot of my process is like boring and like difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, right. and also like, you know, it's so funny, like this director's cut thing, like, you know, sometimes people will post like bloopers or deleted scenes and mm -hmm. stuff like that from, you know, their larger projects. You know, for me, it's like a video essay and people will post like, here's this whole thing I cut or whatever. And then like, people are like, people clamor for that. Like people clamor to know my behind the scenes content and the stuff that I cut and stuff like that. But I'm like, man, if it would be better for you to have seen it, I would have left it in. It's right. better that I cut it, right? That's <laughs> mine. That's not yours. I'm not giving you that. That's the part <laughs> that's beneath my standards. That's the part I didn't want to share. And that's something that's enriching to me personally is that I created something and it didn't go anywhere. That was just me. That was part of the experience of making it. That's not part of the completed product. You know, I think – and that's the part that I would say is more dangerous for like the human soul or whatever – is like um, 
for when you're pressured, you know, by the medium to perform your process all the time. Um, I think like you're robbing yourself of like dignity and you're making mm -hmm. yourself less intentional about what you throw out to the entire world. Yeah. And I think that matters, you know, obviously for a content creator where whatever you tweet is perceived, but I think it also matters like psychologically for people that don't have an audience. Like, because I think that sometimes we don't notice how we've slipped into like, you know, performance mode. Like you think of a funny thing that makes you laugh in your kitchen and then you're like, I should tweet that. But it's like, wait, 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 wait. You're alive right now and you're laughing in your kitchen to yourself. You're experiencing like life, you yeah, know, and you just there. jumped to performing it. You know what I mean? Even if you're performing it to this faceless void and you're not sure if you'll be perceived or not. It's like first experience it. You know what I mean? Decide what you want to perform because some of this is the sweet, sweet nectar of lived experience that you're not right. getting back when you die <laughs> and you need to be there for it. And I think, yeah, social media makes people not there for it. They're pretty, it, it, it enables people to have this phantom limb where they're capable of crushing the experience that they are having into performance, like into a square, you know, into mm -hmm. a reel, into a TikTok, into a tweet, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're not even experiencing first before deciding to try to express some of that experience into a kind of crystallized, valuable version of experience that we want to then throw into the lexicon of culture. <sighs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and this is part of the whole everything is content kind of mentality where, yeah. where you know, it almost doesn't exist if you don't make content out of it. And the, these major players of social media, Instagram, YouTube, all of them know that and they are, I think, in a lot of ways, shaping the way we create anything. And a lot of, a lot of large part of this comes from this, this obsession with analytics. And they keep yes, telling yeah. us like, this is where, okay, your last video did really well, do more of that. Yeah, and they give you the little I, fireworks with the number one out of 10. And then, that, again, that fuck specific that thing. metric. That, I mean, oh, sure, we, I, I love getting that excitement. You know, you get the, the confetti or fireworks or whatever the little dots are that go up. And I'm like, oh, wow, I'm one out of 10. And, but, and then you get that one that's, you know, 10 out of 10, and you just feel like shit. You're yeah. like... They because like crush you. That's the you. real functionality Even though, of the tool. It's not to make you feel good yeah. at the one out of ten. It's to make you feel like shit once you fail to reach that. Because then right. suddenly your emotions, you know, emotions are a lot like rules for action. They're like fuel for action. If I feel angry, that means I need to like do something. You know, if I feel like, you know, I mean, like, um, it's so like, you know, when you feel that crushing negative emotion, you are now, you've just been designed. They just designed you, right? They designed your conscious experience and your emotions to now be in line with their desires, which is we want you to make the maximum clickable thing constantly out to yourself in terms of the numbers, like in terms specifically of numbers and engagement. And here's the weird one, right? That one out of 10 ranking thing we're talking about, like the YouTube metric, right? It's not actually like even your best performing video. It's your best performing it's like, what was the highest click through rate in the last right. 30 days as opposed to the last video in a last in its first 30 days? So it's a very narrow metric because you can have a video that gets like, you know, a bad performance on that. And then ultimately what, you know, like gets you a big boost on Patreon or it turns into your highest viewed video or is the most meaningful video. And they just slice it away. They're like, no, we want it to be immediately most right. addictive possible thing. And if not, we're going to make you feel like shit. It's very motivated <laughs> it's very well, motivated sure, they just they just want to make more billions of dollars off of you i mean as, as producing content on youtube if you're constantly following these analytics and you're spending your entire time just trying to produce what youtube wants you to produce then you're you're basically you're just an employee of yes, YouTube yeah. and you're just doing exactly you're a zombie what they want employee. you to do. you're like an anxious zombie employee that performs your whole life optimized for profit some of my worst performing videos are, I think, some of my best ones right, that yeah. I've made. And so it has nothing to do with numbers. I'm so tired of reflecting on how we talk about that was a good video or it was my best video. Yes. And the only, the only metric we're using is how many people saw yes. it, the yeah. numbers of it. And is this the way 
we should look at art. Do we look at, we go into a, a museum and count how many people looked at one yeah. Rothko and how many people. Yeah, literally. At, yeah, you know, exactly. Picasso yeah, yeah. something. I'm, it makes no sense. It's like we're going to shift the art around the gallery based on how many people are looking at it per day. We're going to start measuring that out and then like slowly increase like different pieces to like a higher place of um, uh, visibility or something based on how many people looked at it for how long. <laughs> yeah, right. it's gross. It's gross. You take curation out of it. Um, like you take difficulty out of it um, and you're measuring everything based on, I don't know, like appeal to our basest addictive instincts. That's terrible. Yeah. You know? Um, so if, if people are interested in hearing me like, you know, talk about this with like a little more, um, uh, I guess like intention or whatever, like I, and against analytics, I wrote an essay about this specifically. Yeah. And then <laughs> in subjectivity really and art one. is a, thank you yeah. very much. And then in the subjectivity and art video at the end of it, I talk about Mr. Beast and how he does this yeah. thing that you're talking about where he just says, you know, I could, anyone like, like he talks about what a good video is. So it's like, I'm trying to mm -hmm. figure out like, you know, what thumbnails, what are, what do the best videos thumbnails look like? You know what I mean? Or like, how do I make a good video? And he tried to research it and figure it out. But is what he means by good is maximized analytics is maximized retention, whatever that means. I never learned and I don't want to, um, no. and maximum viewership and stuff. And that's such a sad way to use the word good, such a deep word that we've been <laughs> totally. working on for so long, like good, <laughs> you know? Um, right. And there's, I would say there's times for both. I, it's also not suited even to, like, human need. You know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. like, even for your business, right? Do you want to be, like, do you want your business to be, to become, like, predicated on trend chasing whatever YouTube's direction is? Like, do you want your business to be completely reliant on if you can capture, you know, as much attention as possible from whoever, you know, like, no, like, I think that in business and art, you want to reach the right people. Again, you want some of this kind of aesthetic sincerity. And so, you know, and, and you want some like loyalty also to like your vision, you know, I, you don't want to be fungible. You don't want to be like trending because like, you know, you're jumping on the latest fad. And so you're trending because, People are consuming you, but they could be consuming anybody. You know what I mean? And they wouldn't care if it was you or not. Like, that's a bad way to build your business. I, I, you, you, there's times to widen your business, to, like, try to do something popular, you know, and try to do something that grows your audience. But there's also times to deepen, you know, your audience and to right. deepen your business, you know. And so that's what, you know, like the subjectivity in art video, like – in it, I talk about, like, Mr. Beast and, like, Encanto, right? Like, negatively. It's right. like, I could have framed it like that. That would have gotten it more clicks. But I didn't on purpose because at that point in, like, my career, I was trying to deepen a relationship with my audience and be and, and start to show, like, some real research and to start to, like, give some real tangible tools to kind of ratify some of these things I intuitively blurted out in my objectivity video, you know? Um, and it did, it does wonders like the stranger things video. That was a really low performing video for me, you know, and yet it bumped my Patreon more than any other video I've ever done. It's a deepening, right. you know? And if you listen to these people's metrics, they're telling you what's best for them. That's what YouTube's telling you. And the same for Instagram, right? When it's like, oh, short form content is where it's at, you know, quote, where it's at. Right. Like, what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> is it where it's at? I would prefer more to like the... Uh, let's use like the jazz slang of like, is, is it actually where it's at? Like, as in that's what's hip and beautiful and cool and valuable and humanly valuable and like sparkly and, 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 and revivifying. Is it where it's at? <sighs> is analytics just generally affecting art among everyone? I mean, is, is everybody on YouTube at their core producing art? Is, is Mr. Beast producing art or has it gotten to the point where we could say, okay, I know he's, making videos that tell a story they're fast paced mr they beast has no aesthetic sincerity I, i'm sorry he's no i don't think he <laughs> okay, is an artist at thank all you. because okay he, good good well, so, because yeah, go he doesn't that. give a fuck about art like obviously he cares right. about the analytics and that's it right and you know like whatever i'm not trying to like like shit talk the human being like he <laughs> does his charity stuff and he's fine like you you can make that your goal but it's interesting to note it's like that's a person devoid of aesthetic sincerity that person will only do what gets the maximum amount of views and will only yeah. work to optimize their analytics, you know? And so I you don't know, know we, if that we is saw art. Him, 
he, we saw him, I was with JJ, we, we saw him at Vid Summit, this, this horrid event we went to, nice. <laughs> where okay. it was just all about how to, and so he seems like, uh, Jimmy seems like just such a nice guy, he, yeah, he just really nice. is, but this is his entire life, and that's all he talks about is the numbers. And they Self-admittedly, have, right? That's what yeah, he says I mean, he this does. Is, yeah. His job is he's figured out how he can hire a staff of people to come up with thumbnails and titles, and and how he, you know, every second of those videos is planned for maximum engagement and yeah. everything. So I guess the question is now, since like there's a huge conference and he's like the, the main guy, he owns half this conference and everybody's trying to do what he does. This is eroding away any kind of integrity on it's, YouTube with yeah. a lot of people because this is their only goal is numbers, followers, and income. Which is like just c- the most cutthroat, pessimistic kind of capitalism that you can imagine. That, like, that's really what totally. it is, right? It's, it's people that are doing this. And, and I guess maybe, yeah, let, let's just draw a line in the sand there, right? It's like if you're doing something that it doesn't matter if you believe in it, you don't believe in it. It's not unique. It doesn't mean much to you except for the fact that you're going to maximize your income. Then that's like, obviously, like, is that art? Like, who the fuck thinks that oh, that's art? That's <laughs> preposterous, right? Um, you know, like... I want to earn money for something that I'm proud of. I want to earn money for something that uh, enriches people's lives, right? That's like, you would think that's like freaking like step one to like try to even like, you know, justify like capitalism as a structure, right? Um, it's, it's necessary, you know? Uh, it's necessary for... I don't know, for quality to emerge in this right. world, right? Like, again, it's this aesthetic sincerity is like a precondition to like beauty existing, right? Um, we can't just... In- and income can follow that. It's yes, not like there, yes. there's some great, oh, the, the starving artist is such a great place to be. No, and, it's not inherently you know, good. You, there's a way no. to link up um, you know, your financial life with uh, your creative life. And you should. You should try to make those things connected. You know, you should try to earn money in a way that you're like, I'm kind of proud of how I earn my money, you know? Um, That's like for me, like with my Patreon, um, that's how I earn most of my income. And I pour energy into it. I try to make my Patreon so valuable so that when I earn money from Patreon, I'm like, fuck yeah, like I'm happy. You know, I'm happy about this. And that people that are paying money to be on my Patreon, you know, can be very happy that they're paying money for this quality Everybody thing, is you know? happy that they're there. That, that's the ideal, right? That's obviously ideal. Is like, and this is what I call, and this is racy of me, but like I, I have an idea of kind of perfection, you know? Um, which is um, when the, let's par- call it like art and audience for this, you know, circumstance, but it can kind of work in a kind of business relationship too. But it's like where... Well, definitely for a business relationship. I mean, just think about it. But, like, it's where I'm producing something that I really believe in and that I feel good about and I kind of enjoy creating, right? And I'm saying something with it. And then the audience is receiving it and they understand what I'm saying and they're also enjoying it and they're happy that I'm doing it. And they're willing to give me money for or compensate me or pour their attention and energy into me. Like, that's a perfect relationship. Like, what's better than that? And there's other ways quality can emerge, you know, like Tommy Wiseau with like The Room or whatever. It's like (laughs) unintentionally creating quality or, you know, giving something you didn't intend to give. But isn't it better when you say something you intended to say the way you intended to say it and someone hears it the way you wanted it to be heard and then you two just like see each other and you're happy about it like isn't that the best thing ever so similarly with business right it's like you want to you know um i want to create something that you know uh is valuable and that it makes sense for people to spend money to receive and then i have the money and then i can reinvest the money to continue doing the valuable thing and the audience and the customer is happy and the performer and the professional is happy like so how do we define value on so let's take just producing yeah, a video because this has also become kind of a buzzword and you hear this a lot at a lot of these kind of conferences about how to you know make it rich on YouTube or whatever and and this is one of the ways people like like uh justify clickbait and thumbnails no matter right. what you call it they're like well it doesn't really matter. I, I'm doing, I'm making enticing thumbnails because once they get there, they'll know the value of exactly, my right, video. Right, I'm always yeah. wondering, well, how, how, who's to define that just because they clicked on it, that, that now it's valuable? Oh, yeah, value is a word that's really been like, um, and this is one of my big kind of pressing points is like, like value is a word that's kind of been stolen by like uh, business, I feel like in some ways. Same with authenticity. 
Oh, f- <laughs> what the, what do you even, what do you mean? What do they, what do they say about authenticity at vid summit or whatever? Well, I mean, it's this kind of thing you hear all the time. And it's, it, that is a word that I truly believe in being authentic, but now it's like basically being co-opted by, you know, drink Pepsi, be authentic yourself or whatever, you know, I don't know. <laughs> or like that authenticity is like, um, just blurting out whatever you think or authenticity is showing your yeah. process and revealing everything. Like authenticity yeah. is like robbing yourself of any sanctuary of self. Like that's what yeah. authentic, authentic means. Um, I think like, but value is a word that definitely is like co-opted by like, you know, again, like cold hearted kind of capitalist evaluations or like, yeah, like algorithmic conversations. And I think that value um, is a really deep word actually. Uh, and I think, you know, so, so I've said in different places, like, you know, money isn't value. Value is value. Don't let them tell you that they're the same thing, you know? And uh, money can be used in a valuable way, but value must, like, reign supreme. And so, and then and then further, I think it's, you can't disconnect these things. Like, Jack Conti, like, the Patreon guy that yeah. also is in the band Pomplamoose, sure. um, he had that one talk that he gave one time that I can't think I, I bristled at. I'm just having this thought, like, now, actually. Um, <laughs> but, like... Jack Conti gave a talk that was like, um, you find the parts of your art that are essential and that you, that are the, you know, I guess the aesthetically sincere things you're convicted about. This is the value, right? And then there's going to be a bunch of stuff that you don't care that much about. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care that much about, let's say, the album art or the title of this song or, you know what I mean? And so his pitch is like, those things that you don't care about so much, you can allow those things to become kind of the algorithmic draws. Like, let someone else kind of make that attractive and then people will you know, you don't care so much about it, so it doesn't matter. And then they'll still have that valuable part at the core of it, right? It's something like that, except said a little more eloquently and sweetly. Um, but the thing is, I, I just dis- I disagree because <laughs> I don't think the thumbnail is separate from the video. Like the book, like you should be able to judge a book by its cover. And if you're not supposed to do that, then people do it anyway. So I think it affects the art, like all these things. I think you tweeting about the process of making something affects how people experience the thing. All of this is kind of paratextual material that feeds into the art experience, you know? And then furthermore, like, and more pressingly, like, what are you doing to yourself? Like the process of kind of lowering your standards and of, of in this one area, you're like, in this one area, whatever, I'll be a cutthroat capitalist algorithmic (laughs) attention game player. But it's like, yeah, but now you're the type of person that will do that in that place. Like, you can't it's guarantee... It's soul-crushing. Yeah, it, you're soul-crushing in that logic now that you've embodied it and acted it out. I feel like it's going to seep into other things you do. You're buying into this story. And I think it's really important to try to, like... You know, I mean, it's not like I never think about, like, trying to make things watchable, I guess. But, like, there's a difference between, like... Mm, I don't know. Trying to make things good... And like, like without compromising yourself, I'm 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 stammering because I don't want to. I'm, I'm trying to think of exactly the right way to say it. I guess. Um, I'm trying to think of where I draw the compromise. Sorry, you have me like introspecting now, but like, I'm trying to think <laughs> of where time. where do I draw the compromise? Like, mm-hmm. because you have to play the game to a certain extent. Well, I'm on YouTube. And I make thumbnails. Well, that's what I mean. And that's why in like the intro to this, I I kind of made the joke that you may not like the idea of being a content creator because that's kind of the the term that's thrown around. And I'm not really fond of that myself. But when you're doing your taxes, what else are you going to call yourself? (laughs) Right. Yeah, (laughs) I guess so. But I I do think that, I mean, over the years, I've made a lot of compromises to, to... the videos I'm making and right. it's only been in the last few years that I've, I'm trying to get over that and try to find really what is the authentic video I want to make. I just came back from a conference last week that was filled with a lot of this kind of soul crushing talk. These are guys who people who are making things and their channels are all about right. building and making and, and so much of the conversation between so many of these people was just analytics and how can I get more views and how can I just right. crush it with thumbnails and all of this stuff and it's like okay I did that for a while <laughs> years ago uh-huh. and I'm uh-huh. over that now I would much rather have a conversation with somebody who's actually talking about what we are doing right yeah well that's we another thing talking about doing something rather than doing it. it's kind of like yeah. not just that idea again <laughs> I realized that for myself I'm just gonna say like I'll just retreat to my subjectivity is that like for myself with my um, a channel, 
like I make YouTube thumbnails and, I, and, and there is a medium that you're playing. You're playing making a YouTube video, which is like a yeah. creative medium, right? So my thumbnails look like YouTube thumbnails. Yeah, you and can't I make just put them... up a black box. No, I mean, like, I mean, you could, but like, I, I don't want to. <laughs> like, so I make a YouTube thumbnail. Like, I play the game of this, like, art medium or whatever. But like, I make it according to my standards. I find the compromise between like the you medium got laser and my beams expression. coming out of your eyes and all kinds like, of shit. Like, I think it's kind of accurate to my personality to some degree. Yeah. So I make a thumbnail that I feel like it speaks to me and also plays the medium appropriate it's me expressed through this medium so it's there's i try to retain the sincerity and i try to make it good by the you know art medium standards or whatever but i think the key thing is then i just drop it i don't change my thumbnails and i don't look at how the thumbnail affected the thing that's for me that's i guess where i maybe draw the line it's like i'll do it i'll make the art but then you perform it and then your hands off like don't stay around don't stick around after you've created the art object to participate in the critique or whatever like i don't know just keep tweaking it or whatever you you made this point in your seven deadly art sins which by the way i think is your Best video. The Seven oh, Deadly Art much. Sins is absolutely fantastic. I've watched it a couple of times already because there's so much truth to what you're talking about there. And that was one of the points you made in there was once you make your art and then the minute it's released to the world, it's no longer strictly yours yeah, because yeah. now everybody else is kind of embracing this. And you talked about George Lucas wanting to go back and Edit fuck with movies. his original yeah. movie and change everything, even though it's a movie that so many people have loved and embraced and everything. And now you're kind of taking that away from them. And you know, one of the way, one of the things that, and, and that might make people feel a little antsy, like as an artist, you're like, wait, but it's mine. Like I want to tinker with it longer Then I'm like, well, don't post your process. Take a little longer. You know what I mean? Because when you post the process, I feel like it it, it totally fucks with that um w- with that relationship. You know what I mean? Because you've posted the pr- and that's the problem. Also, just like with Twitter and stuff, is when you tweet the thought, suddenly like you're identified with this thought that was just passing through your head. You know? Um, and similarly, when you post the process, it's like you're mixing up the ownership of the thing that you're making before it's it's time to do so. Like you have to sit and get a little bored and not perform your whole life and let some of these ideas kind of move through your head and then some of them will fade and then some of them will stay and they'll turn into something. And I think similarly, when you're making art, it's like you have to sit with this thing for a while and think about, is this the thing that I want to release? Do I identify with this thing? How much do I want to edit this thing? Like, have I thought about it? Does this represent me? You know, is my soul in it? And yeah, I think posting the process kind of like, um, advances that, um, uh, like due date or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It like cuts the umbilical cord too quickly. And then, uh, yeah. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> how do you, how do you look at art personally yourself? But if you go, it could be any type of art, music, going into a gallery or whatever. Do you, do you, what are some of the ways you look at art? Is it just strictly an emotional reaction that you receive? And is it, do you feel the need that like to evaluate every piece of art that you see? That's interesting. I think I'm, I, I look at art the way that I kind of perform me looking at art. There's a weird thing. But like my <laughs> YouTube channel, I think, is attractive. It was initially attractive because people like the way I talk about art. And to tell the truth, people have always kind of enjoyed the way I talk about art. They've always bristled a bit at it and also enjoyed it a lot. And I think they used to bristle at it because, you know, I was an arrogant teenager or whatever. But I always used to talk about art is more objective than you think. You know, people yeah. are often, um, you know, That's I was surrounded. fighting words. Right. Yeah. Because people, uh, people are very attached to the narrative that it's all subjective, you know, because they literally believe it. But also, I think it has like these kinds of like utilities, like they're resistant against the kind of inherent elitism that might come in when you talk about art being more objective than you think. Also, I think it's like, again, it's like threatening to your ego a little bit when you're like, no, I thought it was just me self-expressing and it doesn't matter. And no one can say it's objectively bad. I'm like, well, maybe there are some ways to talk about it, you know? But, uh, you know, upon growing up a little bit and thinking deeper, I've realized it's more like it's it's the synthesis. It's that it's objective and it's subjective. It's transjective. And, um, you know, so the way that I look at art has always been... Um, like wanting to connect it to culture was wanting to think about it as language as this is something that's saying something. There's a grammar, there's a syntax, it's interacting with everything else. And did it succeed in what it intended to do? You know, what does it say? Is that a valuable thing to say? Could it say it like better, you know? And that's kind of how I think about art is like, um, you know, I, I, in this kind of more like kind of 
very analytical and like objective lens as like you're trying to say something right and did you succeed in saying it and so i often you know when i'm helping people edit and when i look at my own things i'm thinking about optimization and like cohesion and that's another thing i love that word optimization and i'm mad that that's been co-opted some of these words value <laughs> optimization and like they're not <sighs> they're not yours <laughs> they're deep they're deep you know because um you know i so the way that i this is probably the best way to understand how i think i've got kind of optimization perfection uh, is the word cohesion the way that i kind of uh, define that is that every piece of the art says something about every other piece. Like it's hmm. all aware of itself, you know? Um, and it's one sentence, you know? And, and that's a little bit of a mystic thing, right? It's hard to, you know, nail this down to a kind of rationality, but I'm just trying to generate a lot of these kind of heuristics and tools that I've been using that seem useful to people to use in like, you know, um, pursuing quality. Cause like quality so is like this. Oh, sorry, go on. And the, the objectivity of the art isn't necessarily the skill at which Not somebody at wielded a brush or, or whatever. And Nor this, it's this, ranking this, in all of the arts or whatever. Oh, it's like, oh, no. This, this is what is, I'm trying to get to the, the kind of the meaning of, I've been writing movie reviews on a website for horror movies. I'm a huge horror movie fan. Cool, so yeah, I, okay. I write these movie reviews and I have, I'm trying to approach them as the way I evaluate movies, especially the, the movies I like to watch, which is really low budget, micro budget, schlock <laughs> films, things that yeah. people, a lot of people don't like, but I like, it is not, has nothing to do with like the quality of, of the acting because they probably couldn't afford right. great acting. It has nothing to do with all of these, uh, uh, technical things. You know, it, I can put all of that past. I just want to evaluate the movie based on my emotional reaction to it, how it made me feel, and if I enjoyed myself, if I had a good time with it. But I think when you read most reviews today of movies, they're often kind of clouded under this landscape of, well, how well did the movie perform? And how, right. you know, and that's how we look at movies is like, oh, this was like the, the blockbuster of the year. It was yeah, a good a lot, yeah. It was a good movie because of the um, the dollars it made. And so when I'm writing these reviews, when I first started writing these, they, they asked me, well, we want you to put a number rating on them, you know, right, right. one through 10. And I'm like, well, I don't really like doing that. I, I think if somebody just reads my review, they can decide for themselves. I don't like this idea of just looking at a number of, you know, on art. Uh -huh. Why do we do that? Do we do yeah, that exactly, on pa yeah. paintings or anything else that there's a star review next to them? Don't look at that painting because... It's only got a four star. This one has an eight star. So anyways, I was that like, was, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, okay, I will do this, but here's my rating system. And I've used this for years on IMDb, mostly because I want to kind of, in one small way, skew the rating system. But <laughs> my, my rating system is from six to 10. I don't acknowledge That's one, so awesome. through, <laughs> one through five at all. So, I love that. So like yeah. a, a six is a very rare movie that I just cannot sit through because it just bores me so much. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. really rare. Most movies, 85% of the movies I see are a seven because it's fun. I enjoyed it while I was there. It did what it accomplished to do. And I'll probably forget about it in a month. But yeah. it was great for an hour and a half. And then, yeah. the, you know, eight, nine and 10 have their own little scale. But uh, I think that's really important because it's so important to acknowledge the work that went, went into that and to just eliminate one through five because especially when movies, there's so many people working on these and all of them have their yeah. own artistic and, and nobody is setting out <laughs> to make any piece of art garbage. Everybody yeah, is yeah. trying really hard yeah, to yeah, do yeah. the best thing they can. And I think that that deserves some sort of acknowledgement. But anyways, that's I how love I your, I love your number system. That's so funny. Yeah, no, I love it. Have some respect. You know, everything right. is a six out of 10 to start. Um, I think, and also like, you know, look at Anthony Fantano's scores on like albums or whatever are like, you know, he makes it really explicit that the numerical rankings for him are uh, just in terms of his personal enjoyment. Right. Um, and I think that's, you know, the only, I mean, that's the only like sensical way, I guess, to, to try to engage with, you know, star ratings or something like that is you're just expressing your subjectivity or whatever. But like, but even so, like it, as soon as you introduce the numbers into the, 
uh, game, then like people can get so it's, people are just tempted to get so wrapped up in arguing about the seven out of ten versus the six out of ten. And while you're talking about this, you're not talking about the art, you know? Right. Um, <laughs> so I think the again, it's like the subjectivity is the precondition to access the reality of the art, you know. And when I say talking about art like objectively, I just mean like um, like you know, really, it's it's actually just like engaging with the art like as such and not just talking about your feelings about the art but describing what is in it and trying to like draw draw out the picture of like what did it make me feel and how did it do it i think that's the thing it's like it's not just how it mm. made you feel and whether you liked it or not that's another kind of like this quantification of value in this way it's like you know the more people liked it the better it is and that's just the metric right. it's like binary i'm like no it's not about liking it's like it's about like experience like art is so much more than that and so i think that you know the subjectivity and being honest about your point of view and your feelings and trying to erase away like you know the need to rank it immediately or whatever or figure out mm -hmm. your star rating i think that is the like portal into really engaging with it but then i think to access a kind of more fulfilling nourishing like objective experience of the art then it's like no get specific don't just talk about like that made me feel weird to be like you know what does it mean that it made you feel weird what does it and mean take it that a level, you cringed at this a level deeper is why did it make you feel this certain way? Why is, is this part of the art enjoyable for you? Yeah, taste it. It's a Sontagian thing. It's like really taste mm -hmm. it. And so, and you know, one of the keys, one of the ways to get into that actually is just by description, which is very interesting. And not description of plot, you know what I mean? But like description of the art, like sensuous description of the art, you know? Right. Um, so that's why I like about your six out of 10, started a six out of 10 thing is like, and, and that my, my, you know, my brother, uh, Ben from Canada also makes videos sure. on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that was part of, of, uh, he has actually influenced me intensely on this because that's part of his thesis is that all movies are perfect. And so all of his videos, here's another thumbnail thing. I think he just goes like every like uh like video essay he does about a movie he just does like perfection like that's the thumbnail of all of them. It's like it's perfect. And what's kind of interesting about that attitude is if you walk into the art with the idea that it's already perfect then that actually gets you again deeper into engagement like immediately you know it's just a heuristic it's just a tool that launches you into sincere engagement faster and i think that six out of ten thing does also and then yeah <laughs> trying to um you know so so when i'm i'm making kind of critiques of movies and i get frustrated with a movie generally it's because um i love it like i love it and i see what it's doing and i and i want to see it even more pure. I think it can be done even more pure. And that's the meaning of when I'm like critical of something technically on so-called objective grounds is I'm like, this is one way to say this. And I think it can be said again and it can be said like even more intensely. And I guess that's, I'm right. always looking for more intensity, more optimization, more cohesion because I'm a perfectionist. This is the thing, right? So, you know. And why do people want to fight over this stuff too? And, and I don't know, if this seems like a more modern, and this is probably has a lot to do with social media too, but when you post an opinion about a movie partic in particular online and, and you'll see these movie reviewers who will do this and you will get comments like, wait, you like that movie? Well, now I can no longer trust anything you say because <laughs> I, I disagree on this Strange. one thing yeah. you have. And it seems like a really common thing that people are like, wait, you, we have to all agree on this everything or the one thing is invalid. Yeah, it's pretty intense like status uh, thing. I, I think that's always been true is people think of taste and like um, culture and like fashion as like st their status things. You know what I mean? Like, um, so uh, we're trying to, uh, so, so people definitely use like rankings of art and like opinions of art as status symbols as they kind of always have. You know what I mean? Like yeah. um, you're into horror movies. Like uh, I'm not into horror movies like at all. Right. So your mm -hmm. extensive knowledge of like B horror movies or something, right. Doesn't right. give you any like status with me in my books. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, if you had like a kind of extensive knowledge of like, you know, rap music or something, then we, right. that would suddenly be like, Oh, like I, you could signal that. And then we would, you know, gravitate towards each other. And then we would feel like we're part of this in group now. Um, and also you would like, you know, that would be a way for you to have a higher status in my estimation or in uh, this community or something. Right. So, you know, uh, but, but then like, if I'm in a group with like you and three other people that are all super into horror movies, then I'm going to have like lower status in this way. So I think there is this kind of like primordial need for status and that's kind I of, I just what's want more status expressed. with you, CJ. I really do. <laughs> oh man. Um, 
So I think on one hand, that's what people are doing. They're just signaling status and, and that's how they, yeah. they, and so when they identify, and then there's also that parasocial thing or whatever. It's like when you identify with someone's voice, like um, you want them to agree with you on everything because like yeah. that's part of your identity or something. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. I don't know why people do it, but um, I, I, there's a lot of like, uh, I don't know. It's like an invalid critique. I think a lot of the time is like, she's is going to veer off and I hope you can maybe vaguely see how it's connected, but like an invalid okay. critique t to me of like a movie a lot of the time is when someone starts basically just like fantasizing about what they wish the movie was. They were oh, like, yeah. it would have been better if this happened or like this was stupid or this story shouldn't have been told or like this, the yeah. tone was, was, was mixed or stupid. I'm like, I'm like, you're, you're like not engaging with the thing. Like, cause you can't say like my critique of this thing is that it should be something else. I'm like, that's not a critical engagement. You're not tasting the thing. You're not even Good curious point. about the thing. You're imagining a fictional alternative thing that doesn't exist. And you're comparing your platonic form of this movie that doesn't exist <laughs> with the movie that exists. So again, it's like, start with your six out of 10. First, let's just describe this thing before we start referring to heavenly forms that don't exist, that you prefer it to be that you didn't make. I don't know. Sorry. It just drives me nuts. Uh, this but, is fantastic. I think no, um, it's, so it's also true sometimes for like when people have, um, I don't know, when people on social media get kind of a very purity testy with like, um, yeah, people's opinions. I don't know. It's mm -hmm. like it's, it's analogous to me where it's like critiquing someone's opinion or like their exp their subjective experience. Right. And you're critiquing it like your subjective experience should be different. Like, what? Right. Why? What do you gain? Right. Like, what for? <laughs> Which, again, is, like, kind of embracing the everything is perfect to some degree. Yeah. Kind of it is is almost, like, always as a rule more enriching and uh, th than the alternative, I guess. Like, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think most people read reviews because they just want their own opinions to kind of be To validated. be echoed back to them, right? Yeah. Right. Well, I think there's, like, two different way let's let's just say there's like two different ways that reviews can function one is everyone just pointing out their like pouring out their raw subjective feelings uh like of generally kind of like or dislike and then people use that pool of aggregated subjective testimony to decide what art they're going to engage with right so that's a kind of very cold way to think about reviews is everyone just says what they like and what they don't. And then we can navigate, you know, based on that. And that's something that I think yeah. Anthony Fantano is broadly doing, right. Is that he's just sharing his subjective taste to help people kind of navigate, you know? Um, and that's, fine but then i think a lot of time people are actually looking for reviews i mean i do this like after i see a movie i really like sometimes i'll go right. this is a shameful thing for me to admit because this is very against like you know it's not uh it's not very enlightened of me but sometimes after i see a really good movie i'll go to the reddit i do it like every time I, i'm lying right now to save face <laughs> i go to the reddit discussion thread to read other people talking about the movie and uh -huh. i'm not doing it so that i can taste it better or get a different angle on it i'm doing it just to have to continue my experience of the movie like i just want people to say what i think and that feels good <laughs> i can see that i don't it's, there's nothing wrong with that i think that's a normal well, i think thing it's because i'm kind of like a i can be like a little bit like a elitist or whatever and and i i or or i just want to be like i want to like pure artistic engagement or something so my feeling is like after watching the movie, I should just sit and feel it and think and be inside of it. And that's yeah. it. Right. And not mm -hmm. like then, you know, go watch some other random movie reviewer talk about it that like, I don't even respect the movie reviewer. Like, why am I doing this? Like, I just want to keep like, if you want to keep watching the movie, just watch it again, you know, <laughs> and yeah. then also give yourself the space after watching it to not pollute your mind with other people's words about it. Like give yourself some space to have experienced it and to continue experiencing yeah. it. Right. And see what that feels like. Again, it's like this human thing before watching other people perform their experiencing of the art and before performing your own experience of the art via a review or whatever, how about you just experience it for a sec? Like try to give some space, right. you know? Yeah. This applies to all art. We don't have to, I think a lot of people, and it, you see this with movies, of course, is people will sometimes leave the movie and say, I didn't get it. Yeah. I don't understand it. Well, everybody's experience is going to be different there. And a lot of times you don't necessarily have to understand the full thing to enjoy it. Yeah. Or or even even enjoying is a weird word. Like, you know, pleasure especially like in like philosophy, you know, when people talk about, you know, pleasure is better than suffering or whatever. Um, you know, like people like have sometimes too narrow a definition of pleasure, you know, cause, cause pleasure can be a really weird and complicated thing. Like I can 
Um, I mean, of course. I mean, you like horror movies, right? And also kind of like... I can get pleasure out of being really uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. So there's like a richness of experience, you know? And there's also like the plurality and, vari of, of, and um, v variety of experience where it's like I can... When that's generally how I feel about like a lot of art, I guess, generally, right? It's like, like even if I don't like something, it's more valuable to have experienced something than not. Uh, and also just because an experience isn't one that I gravitate towards doesn't mean it's not a worthy experience. You know, it doesn't mean it's not a worthy area for creative exploration, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, be before we go, do you have any advice for artists who are posting on social media, kind of how they can look at that relationship in a, in a healthy way? Yeah. Um, I think that what, I advocate for broadly is for restoring the dignity of professions. I know that seems almost strange, but like, I think what people should think about when they go to create things is what culture are you interacting with? You know, are you a film critic? Is that what you're going to do? Cause if that's what you're doing, go read some Roger Ebert. You know what I mean? Think about mm -hmm. what it means to be doing like being a film critic. Like, is it just you're sharing your subjective reactions to things or are you trying to like, add to it somehow, somehow by like sharing your heuristics for tasting this thing and your interpretation of it. You know, I think that, uh, social media kind of allows people to get into posting and trying to build an audience or trying to make art without really thinking about what it is that they're doing, you know? And so what I want to draw people's attention towards is like, you know, if you're a musician, like think about what that means and like treat that like it's a craft, like it's a craft and it's an identity, you know, and you are a musician first in you sitting here and playing music or you're a songwriter first when you write a song. And that's what you are first before you capture that song in an Instagram reel or whatever. Before the reel. Yeah. yeah. So just I want to remind people to like, um, you know, Jaron Lanier in like the intro, the prelude of uh, You Are Not a Gadget um, says you have to be a person before you can, you have to be someone before you can share yourself. So that's what I kind of want artists to know, you know, is like, you are an artist if you create the art and that's between you and God first, you know, and then the way that you share that art, um, you know, can take a lot of different forms, but like, you just got to hold on to that, to that identity and know that that's what you are before you're a YouTuber, you know, um, before you're a popular Instagram account, right? Are you a painter? You know, are you a, a woodworker? Um, yeah. So that, that's basically, yeah. so like I declare that I'm an artist and a philosopher and I try to take those things really seriously. And I think my life is a lot richer for it. And then I actually think that's also um, pretty attractive, you know, and, and on social media. I think that people respect that a lot. If you come across as a person that is like a whole person, like, you know, the performance right. of your personhood isn't all of your personhood, you know, I think that um, there's something magnetic and attractive about that, too. So it's like it's good for the audience. It's good for you. And uh, it's good for art, I think. Yeah. So much better than just identifying yourself as influencer. Ugh, yeah, what is that? That's nothing, right? <laughs> no idea. Uh, CJ, it was great talking to you. It was uh, nice uh, talking to you, too. Thank you for having me on and uh, letting me neurotically fall apart in your space. <laughs>